God bless you. Thank you all for being us wherever you are in the world, wherever you are in the country, in the United States. I know y'all all over the world. And I'm very grateful that you joined us tonight on Tuesday Night Bible Study. And uh, I'm, you know, I look forward to the opportunity to share with you all and interact with you all. Last week, we uh, discovered questions for the whole week. I never got to Romans 15. That's where I'm at now, Romans 15. I never even got to it because it took the whole session to answer some very provocative and interesting questions. And so, we, you know, I, I do want to do that from time to time. And that's my plan is occasionally to do that. And by the way, you all sent and we answered those questions because they all came from chapter 14. Questions that provoked your mind. And what that made me know is that you're listening, you're comprehending, you are incorporating it and thinking through how you want to apply it to your life. And that makes me feel great that you're actually paying attention and you're comprehending what the scriptures say. That is what the Lord calls us to do with his word. So let me thank you all for doing that. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that. So thank you so very, very much for um, your commitment to do that. I'm going to pray and then we're going to do Romans chapter 15 today. Uh, Hopefully we'll be able to get through that uh, because I think there are um, actually 33 verses. And if I spend two minutes or a minute on each one, It'll take me close to 35 minutes, 40 minutes just to go through that. So uh, let's pray and then we'll dive into the scriptures for today. Father, thank you for the privilege and opportunity to come before your sons and daughters. Thank you for just the privilege of going through your word and dissecting and studying your word together and determining how we can apply it to our lives. I pray that as we approach Romans 15, that you would give us your insights, your revelations, your word, how it applies to each one of our lives. And though people are in various parts of the country and yes, even the world, God, speak to them through your word about how this particular study applies into their personal lives. I pray, Father, that you put a hedge around every home and every location and every place where people are watching this Bible study. And allow them to hear your voice, even above my above my voice, let them hear your voice and the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting and speaking to them about what it is you desire for them to do and you desire for us to do. And we pray this in the marvelous and mighty name of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to dive into Romans chapter 15. So let's go to Romans chapter 15 and. Uh, let's start with um, the first six verses gives us a section to study and it's called the first six verses deals with bearing others burdens. That's what is that's what we the heading that we put on these first six verses bearing others burden. Let's start with verse number one. It says we then who are we are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let me read that again. It says we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples. That word scruple means the weaknesses of the weak. Let us bear with the weaknesses of the weak and not to please ourselves. What does that tell us? That tells us those of us who are strong, are directed to help carry the load of those who are not as strong. That's a, that is a, that's the call of God to all of us. Those of us who are stronger, who have developed a level of maturity and seasonedness to us ought to help carry and bear the load and help those who are not as strong as we might be. We're called to help lift them up and carry them and help them make it through whatever the stresses or challenges are of their lives. And, and, and if the truth be told, everybody on this Bible study who's been saved any length of time, you've had somebody in your life, somebody in who you have relationship with, who somehow during the course of times when you were weak, prayed with you, cried with you, empathized with you, shared scriptures with you, Uh, gave you some level of strength to keep going, some level of strength to carry on. Somebody in your life did that. And you're able to get to where you are because somebody in your life came along and helped you carry the load. And so that's where we start. This verse, this passage starts off telling us that that's what we're called to do, that those of us who are weak are to do that. And then it says the latter part of verse one, that we're not to be 
living our lives pleasing ourselves. That's what verse 1 starts up saying. Says, We're not to please ourselves. Life is not about satisfying yourself. Um, we're not, we, the call is not for us to just uh, highlight and lift up and elevate uh, uh, what we want. That's not the call of God upon our life. Verse 2 says this. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. How can we help our neighbor do good, be good? And that leads us to edification. We should not seek to please ourselves, but others. That's what a true Christian does. We, a mature Christian does. We are, we are called of the Lord not to be walking about pleasing ourselves. This is a, a affirmation of verse one. Even it is a reiteration of verse, the latter part of verse one, that we're not to please ourselves, but we're to please and to help others win and leading to them being edified. That word edification means to build them up. It means to help them to be built up be, to become everything that God desires and wants them to be. Again, that's that's you know that's why. You know, let me let me say this is why participation and engagement in church is important and significant. It's important and significant because God is calling us to be in relationship with each other. That's what, what, that's why church is important. That's why being among the family of God, I know there's a movement in, in, in the world and in our churches that tells people that um, you don't need the church and you don't have to go to church to worship God. And, and though, though you don't have to be in church to worship God, uh, you can be any place and worship God, but you do need to be around a family of believers who can edify you and strengthen you. Anybody who's not actively participating in the church family or in relationships of, in the kingdom of God cannot be as strong as they could be if they found themselves among other people. And that that is what Christ calls us to do, to be in, in relationship and to be in family with other people because that enables us and helps us to be everything that God wants us to be. Now ask yourself the question. I know you think you can be at home and be okay, but you cannot. You will not be as strong as you could be. If I, if I build a fire with 10 logs and that fire is blazing and burning and I reach in, I take one of those logs away from that pile of 10 logs that's on fire and put it off by itself and there it is, sitting alone away from the other nine logs, that one single log is going to burn out a whole lot quicker than it would had it stayed with the other nine. And that's, that's, just, a, that's just the truth of life, that when you hang around and stick with others who are carrying the same burden, headed in the same direction, have the same passion, have the same interests, have the same concerns, who can build on each other and lead each other, it helps you to win. Some of you know I just finished my master's degree. Well, I just, that was almost a year ago, I got my uh, master's degree. And every semester, when I looked at the syllabus for that semester, I wanted to quit. Not just me, but all the other members of my class wanted to quit. But you know what we did? We encouraged each other. We talked to each other. We prayed for each other. We talked each other out of quitting. And that's what kept us in there, that we had each other to lean on and depend on and support each other and to to help each other through the work that we had to do, the schoolwork that needed to be done, to answer questions from each other on the questions that we had or or insights that we shared with each other. And that's what the family, that's what relationships do. And this is what this is telling us to do, that we are called to do that. Look at verse three. Let's go to verse three, because I, I could talk forever on verses one and two. Um, that we're not to be pleasing ourselves, but pleasing others and bearing, helping each other bear the infirmities of each other. Verse three says, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And here's what that is saying. Verse number three is saying that Christ is our model. He was reproached by others, but he still served. He still gave. He still sacrificed. He still had interest in what others did. And that's what that verse three meant. He is our example. And even though people reproached him and talked about him and ridiculed him and lied on him and rejected him, even though he went through all of the things that could have and would have in normal circumstances made a, a human being want to quit. 
Even though he was reproached by others, he still pushed past that and served other people. And, and that's that's what that verse is telling us, that even though people reproached him, rejected him, talked about him, treated him bad, he still found it in his heart to serve other people. And I, I thank the Lord that Jesus is our role model in that regard. Praise the Lord for that. Verse number four uh, says this, says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What is that telling us? That's telling us that the scriptures were written to teach us how to endure that word patience. Here's what patience means. Whenever you see the word patience in the New Testament, here's what it means. It means to stick with God even while you're going through difficult moments and challenges. It means to continue to abide in your relationship with God, even when you find yourself in challenging, struggling situations. We are still called of God to walk in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to him uh, and still walk with him and have the hope that God's going to bring you out. So the scriptures are an example for us. That's what this is saying. The scriptures were written to teach us and model for us and give us examples throughout all of the Bible of people who have gone through hell, who have been rejected, talked about, ridiculed, uh, crucified, those who have gone through being put in jail, put in the midst of a lion's den, uh, put in the fiery furnace. We got situation after situation that was written to teach us to still stay with God even while you're in the midst of challenging moments and have hope that the God we serve will is is capable and will bring you through. And that's what this verse is telling us, that we have hope in God. Somebody say, I got hope in God. You ought to have hope in God. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your challenges are. I don't know what you're facing in life, but I know that through the course of your journey, you're going to face something that's going to want to make you turn around and walk away and quit. But the scripture teaches us to hang in there and keep on having hope even before God. Verse number five. Did I read verse number four? For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. I don't, did I read that? I, don't, I, I got so excited. I might have jumped ahead of myself. I can't remember. But that word patience means that we're going to endure with God and stick with him even though and we're going to persevere. We're going to. And that's what that word means. We're going to hang in there with the Lord, even though. We find ourselves in difficult moments. Here's the last uh, two verses of this first section, verses five and six. I'm going to read these two together. It says this. Now, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and with and with and one mouth glorify the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read it again. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is telling us that it's a, it's a brief prayer. He's praying that God gives you the correct mindset toward each other, that we look toward helping each other, serving each other, praying for each other, encouraging each other. That's that is, in fact, the mandate and the call of God. And that's what his prayer is, that we have the we be of the same mind toward each other and that we have the one one mindset and one mouth, one communication toward each other. Glorify God by virtue of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he does for us. That's what Christ Jesus does for us. He gives us the capacity and the ability to be everything God wants us to be in encouraging each other. So that first six verses deals with the encouragement for you and I to be bearing one another's burden. And that's what the church is called to do. Not tear each other down. Matter of fact, when you get in a conversation tearing each other down, you are participating in sin. When you get into a situation where you're ridiculing and talking bad about each other or 
or speaking negatively about others, you are an active participation participant of sin. Because the scripture calls us not to do that. It calls us to be encouraging to each other. Now, we're going to go to the next section, which is uh, verses 7 through 13. And 7 through 13 deals with us glorifying God together. That's what these verses talk about. How we are to glorify God together. Verse number 7. Let's read that together. Here's verse 7. Therefore... Receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. I love that verse right there. We are to welcome each other the same way that Jesus welcomed us. We are to receive each other, welcome, love on each other. Uh, and, that's, and that's my call to us. I don't care what, what a person's done in their past or their history or what their situation might be. We're called to welcome one another. We're to love each other. We are we are to welcome each other the same way Jesus welcomed you. And when you came to Jesus, I want you to think about how raggedy your life was when you came to Jesus, how jacked up your life was, how lost you were in your life when you first reached out to Jesus. And all of us can testify to the fact that when we first looked to the Lord and we first came to Jesus, he received us with open arms and with open love. He he embraced and loved us and accepted us. Thanks be to God. Somebody ought to give God the praise about that. He loved us unconditionally. He loved us. He accepted us and and embraced us. And I thank the Lord that he did that on our, that regardless of where we were. And that's how we that's what we're called to do with each other. Let's go to verse eight and nine. I'm going to read these two verses together. Verses eight and nine. Now I say. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Verses eight and eight and nine. Let me tell you what that means. Let me give you the the, 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 the synopsis of that, that Jesus became. Here's what this means. He became a servant to the Jews. He talks about that. Jesus became a servant to the circumcised. That's what he's saying. He became a servant to the Jews. Why? So that God's truth would be fulfilled, manifested, realized. So that God's truth would be manifested so that the Gentiles would be able to also glorify God. Jesus became a servant to the Jews so that God's truth would be manifested and fulfilled so that the gospel can not only go to the Jews, but it would ultimately make its way to us Gentiles. And that's what we are. We are the Gentiles. We're, we're the ones that are outside of the chosen family of God. Uh, for outside of the Jewish family. And thanks be to God, um, Jesus became a servant to the Jews for the truth, so that God's truth could be confirmed and the promises that were made to the fathers so that the, the here's what he's saying, Genesis talks about this, how a promise was made to Abraham that he would be a blessing to many nations. That's uh, Genesis 12, 4, I believe. Jot that down. That's the verse. I didn't make a note of that, but just jot that down. That that's, a, that's, that's the, uh, the fulfillment of it going to the Jews so that um, Abraham and his descendants could be a blessing to the world. And that means it's so that the Gentiles would be able to glorify God. It, it, Jesus had to, get, had to come so that God's truth would be fulfilled to the Jews and the gospel would make it. And, and get manifested so that we as Gentiles would be able to have a relationship with God. Let's go to verses 10 and 11. Uh, uh, and again, he says. Uh, and, and again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. That's verses 10 and 11. What does that mean? That means the scriptures are declaring that one day the Gentiles will glorify God. And, and has that not come to reality? That you and I are Gentiles and we're glorifying God. We, we have a relationship with him. And as a matter of fact, this is a scripture that is affirming some prophetic words. I'm not going to turn to these verses, but just jot them down and read them in your devotional time or some, in your study time. Deuteronomy 32, 43. 
as well as Psalm 117, verse 1, make a note of that, that those are prophetic verses to speak to the fact that us Gentiles would one day glorify God. And this verse, these two uh, verses 10 and 11 are affirming those prophetic words that in fact the scriptures is declaring that us Gentiles would one day walk with God and give God glory for our lives. And in, in that great news that in God's mind, even way back in Deuteronomy and back in the Psalms, God had it in his mind when he created. Matter of fact, when he created the world, before he created the world, he had it in his heart and mind and he prophetically spoke. This is why I can put my confidence in the scriptures, because when Deuteronomy was written and Psalm was written, when these verses, these prophetic verses were written, they were reflecting that God would make a way of salvation to be available to Gentiles. And that would be to you and I, that he made it possible for it, for the gospel to be available to us. And I'm glad I, I'm, I'm praising the Lord and I'm glorifying God that he has made the gospel available to us. But he doesn't stop right there. Look at verse 12. And again, here's another prophecy. Verse 12. And again, verse 12, Isaiah says, there, there shall be a root of Jesse and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him. The Gentiles shall hope that that's a ooh, that's I want y'all to get a hold of that. Understand that Isaiah prophesied. Here's what this is saying. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would provide hope to the Gentiles. And that 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 prophecy is mentioned in Isaiah 11, 1 and Isaiah 11, verse 10. Isaiah prophesied. What did he prophesy? And, and, and it, here, right here, it's mentioned here, uh, affirmed in verse 12. Isaiah says that there shall be a root of Jesse. That's speaking of Jesus. And he who shall reign shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. That Jesus is going to rise and even reign over the Gentiles. And in him, the Gentiles shall have hope. That's you and I. We is Gentiles. We are we are, we were not originally a part of the family of God, but God has adopted us into the family of God. Isn't that great? Isn't that great word that God made us made it possible for you and I to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And I'm thrilled. I, I am super excited and thankful that the God we serve made it. He, uh, we're driving home this point that he made it possible for us as Gentiles to have a relationship with the eternal God. And that's great news. That's great word. Verse 13. Let me read verse 13. Now, this too is a prayer, by the way, saints. This is a, a, a prayer of, of, uh, of hope. And, and now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Here's what that means, that it is a prayer of hope for you to have joy and peace by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a prayer that you would have joy and peace that is provided to you and I by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's a matter of fact, that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring into our lives joy and peace. And, you know, that's what most people lack in their lives is joy and and peace. But here's what the Holy Spirit's role is to bring to you joy and peace. And God wants that to be available to you. Thanks be to God. Now, let's go to that concludes this whole section that deals with glorifying God together, that Jews and Gentiles come into a relationship with Jesus, with the eternal God through Jesus Christ, that he's the one who made it all possible for us to be able to worship God, to sing to God, to have the presence of God in our lives. Jesus made that possible. And it was prophesied through, through the scriptures for it to come to pass. And I don't know where y'all are. I thank God for it. Now let's go to the next section of the scripture, which is in verses 14 through 21. And this is uh, uh, a discussion about uh, the apostle Paul going from Jerusalem to Illyricum. He made a journey and he's talking about uh, this journey he's going to take uh, from Jerusalem to Illyricum. Uh, verse 14 says this. Now I myself, verse 14, am confident 
concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. That's verse 14. Here's what Paul is affirming. Paul is affirming that they, the Gentiles in Rome, are filled with goodness and knowledge and that they are able to admonish each other, filled with goodness and knowledge, that they are filled with God's goodness and the knowledge of God. You know, for a long time, many Jews thought that the Gentiles could not possibly have the presence of God in their life. They couldn't even possibly have a relationship with God. And that's one of the reasons Paul is affirming to the Jews in Rome, because this, this is a church of both Jews and Gentiles. He's affirming that even the Gentiles have good goodness and knowledge and the Jews, too, are capable and, they, and that they are able to encourage each other, admonish each other, support each other. Reflect with each other is what he's saying, that he's making that celebration that that uh, uh, they all collectively are able to be filled with God's goodness and God's knowledge. Somebody give God praise that God's filled you with his goodness. You're not good on your own. You're not good because of your own dealings and your own workings. You're good because God made it possible for you to be able to be good. And to have knowledge. Verse verse 15 and 16. I'm going to read these two together. Nevertheless. Brethren, I have written more boldly to you on, on some points has reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Oh, boy, that, I hope you all got all of that. I, I, I've summarized verse 15 and 16 to say this, that Paul is boldly reminding them that he was graced by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He was anointed, gifted, empowered by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Why? So that the Gentiles would be able to bring an offering to God that would be acceptable. That what the Gentiles bring to God would be acceptable. By the way, I know I keep saying this over and over again. The Gentiles is by and large you and me. We're all we're Gentiles. We're outside of the family of God. But we have the privilege and the opportunity and the power. And we've been gifted and called by God to bring an offering to God that will be acceptable. Why? Because we were sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctified you, set you apart. That word sanctified Right. This to the side means to be made clean. God cleaned you up. You was you was living raggedy and jacked up lives. But the Holy Spirit sanctified you and set you aside. Why? So that what you offered to God would be acceptable. This ought to make somebody shout. I know it makes me shout when I think about God, that what he has done, it's made it possible for me to come to him and offer up a sacrifice that is acceptable to him, that is pleasing to him, that he receives. God receives your praise. When you're in worship and you lift your hands, it's acceptable to God. When you open your mouth, it's acceptable to God. When you give him an offer up of praise to him, it is acceptable to him. And I'm thrilled and excited that God made it possible for us to be in a posture or a position to be able to offer our sacrifice to him. And we've been sanctified by God. Thank the thanks be to God. Man, I just I let me move, oh Lord. I, I, I just when I think about the fact that God, that's what God has done for us, that He has made it possible for us to do that. Uh and, and I like what Paul says in verse first verse fifteen. He said, I'm I'm writing even more boldly to you on, on this this point. He said, I got some points and I'm reminding you that God has given him the grace. He says, I'm bold. I'm, I'm, I'm declaring this boldly, unapologetically. I'm being, I'm being emphatic about this, that God has made it possible for me as a minister to bring Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, to tell them about the gospel of God. Amen. I know some of y'all want some, some people want to lead the Gentiles out, but we're in, we're in there. We're a part of that. We're a part of the family of God. And that's to me, that just makes me want to shout. Verse 17. Let me. I'm just. I'm, I feel like I'm rushing. Let me slow down. Therefore, verse 17. I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus, 
in the things which pertain to God. Paul, Paul is glorifying Christ because of this. He says, I'm giving God the glory. I reason the glory in Christ Jesus in the things that pertain to God. I'm, I'm giving God the praise and giving God the thanks about this very thing that God has done. Verse 18 and 19 says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. But in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. What is what is all of that saying? In verse uh, matter of fact, this, verses eight, this, this is verse 18 and 19. Paul is saying, I'm only speaking of the things that, that were accomplished through me, Paul is saying, to help the Gentiles. He says, he said, I'm not, I, I'm talking about the signs and wonders that the Holy Spirit did. God said, Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm declaring, I'm celebrating, I'm, uh, I, I wouldn't dare uh, talk about that I did it, but Christ, I'm talking about the things that Christ accomplished through me in word and deed, uh, to help bring the Gentiles to a place of obedience, to bring them uh, to a place of, of sacrifice and obedience to God. Thanks be to God that God has done these things by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, both from Jerusalem and even to Illyricum, that God did this thing because I preached, I fully preached the gospel of Christ. Let me, ooh, let me slow down, slow down. Here, let me tell you what Paul is saying. Paul said, because I did the very basic thing of preaching the gospel, people's lives got changed. And that was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. People get changed not because of you. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of us telling people that Jesus Christ died for their sins and that they can be forgiven. When we, when we share that story, when we preach and make that declaration to our family and friends, co-workers and relatives and neighbors, it's, it's us sharing that story that penetrates the heart and the power of the Holy Spirit is at work to bring people to a place of salvation. And, 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 and Paul is saying, um, uh, th this, is, this is not something I did. That's what Paul is saying. Uh, I'm not talking about something that 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 I did it in my power and strength. It's me simply sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel. And, and I think that's important to you all. You know, you don't have to argue with people. Don't debate people about where Cain's wife came from. Don't debate people about whether Jesus was black or white. None of those things is going to make a difference in people's lives. What's going to make the difference is when you tell them that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and that they don't have to fear standing before a holy God. That they can be forgiven of their sins. That Jesus died on the cross for their sins and was buried and took their sins far away. And that early Sunday Jesus did what nobody else did. He conquered death and got up out of the grave. When we tell that story. And that's what Paul is saying. He says from Jerusalem to Illyricum. He says I fully preached the gospel. And it's not because of what I did, but it's me preaching the gospel. It is the power of the Holy Spirit of God that brought that to pass. That's what made that happen. And that's what I'm saying to you today. Make it your role to share the gospel with people. I hope you all understand what I'm saying. Our church has grown to be the church that it is because we're not trying to do this in our own strengths and power or might. We are simply declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that power enters into a person's life and changes their heart. And that's that's great news. Verse 20, 21. Let me let me let me uh, I can spend the rest of the day talking about some of these verses. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Has it has it is written for to whom he was not announced, they shall see and those who have not heard shall understand. What is Paul saying here in verses 20 and 21? Paul made it his aim to preach the gospel. But he says, I, I, I don't want to go where others have already preached. Because if I try to do that, I, I might be building on someone else's foundation. Somebody else has already gone in and preached. He said, but 
I want to go where it has not been announced. I want to go to a place where it has not been proclaimed that those who have not heard shall understand. I want to go where people haven't heard the gospel. And that's one of the reasons he went to the Gentiles. He came to the Gentiles because they had not heard. And so we should make it our role and our responsibility as a church. Matter of fact, we are participating with organizations that's writing the, writing the Bible in, in languages where it hasn't been written. We're, we're supporting organizations to write the Bible in languages that have not yet heard the gospel. Y'all need to know that your church is doing that. The First Baptist Church of Glen Arden is supporting. And we try to go to places in the far reaches of, of distant places where, where there are not television sets, where there's not the Internet, where there's not radio stations or television stations. We're going to the hedges and the highways, the lowliest of places, so that the gospel can be proclaimed to places where it is not heard. And that's what Paul says. I want to go to those who have not heard but they shall hear and they shall understand once they hear okay now let's let's go to the next and final section of these verses let's go to uh, the next section where Paul plans to visit Rome this is where and this is going to be verses 22 through 33 this is the final section of this particular chapter and Paul is talking about his journey to uh, visit with them in Rome. Let's read verse 22. It says this, for this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. And so in his in the first uh, verse that he speaks about, um, Paul is uh, saying that he uh, he wants to make a trip to see them. And so he says um, he has been prevented from coming to Rome. He's been prevented. Something hindered him. Uh, I know it, it, it uh, brings both those things up. I missed that in, in, in this uh, PowerPoint here. But um, Paul has been prevented from coming to Rome. And then he says in verse 23 and 24, let me read those. But now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. So what he is saying is Paul says uh, the work I'm doing where I am now is no longer. Uh, I don't have any more any more work here, but I desire to come to Rome and I plan to come and see you when I go to Spain. I'm all, in other words, here's what he said. I'm going to Spain and on my way to Spain, I'm going to stop by and see you all in Rome. That's what he's saying. Verses 23 and 24. I got prevented from coming to Rome before, but now when I go to Spain, I'm going to stop by uh, to see you. Verse 20, 25 says, but now I am going to, um, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So he says, look, but before I get there, uh, verse 25, I'm going to first travel to Jerusalem. I'm going to come by way of Jerusalem and then I'm going to come see you. Verse 26 says, for it pleads those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So here's what he's saying. The saints in Macedonia and Achaia desire to help the poor saints in Jerusalem. And so uh, he says it pleads those saints in Macedonia and Achaia to make a to give an offering for the poor people in Jerusalem. And so I'm going to stop by there and get that offering and bring it so that I can help the saints in Jerusalem. I'm going to go and take this offering to them and stop by and present it to them. Paul, you know, is speaking about the generous saints. One, one of these, I have to teach about the generosity of the saints in Macedonia who were poor themselves. Let me, just, let me stop for a moment and talk about this. The saints in Macedonia are poor themselves, but yet even in their poverty, even in their struggles, they carved out a little bit of what they had available to them to give to the saints in Jerusalem. And that's, and that's, and that's teaching us something. That's a huge, um, Model for us that even when you don't think you have it, uh, you break off a little piece of what you have to help somebody who's less fortunate than you. And that's what the saints, that's what the saints in Macedonia did. And we're celebrating them. They're helping the saints in Jerusalem who are struggling. But the saints in Macedonia thought it thought they were humble enough to make it possible that they made it possible to do that. Verse 27. 
It says it pleased them indeed. And they are their debtors for if the for if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Verse 27. What does that mean? It means that the, the saints in Macedonia and Achaia were indebted to the people in Jerusalem because they had helped them spiritually. The saints in Jerusalem had helped the saints in Macedonia spiritually. And so they want to return the favor and help them materially. So they said, look, those people in Jerusalem have helped us become spiritually strong and deposited in us spiritually. So we want to help them with our material blessings that what what we have that we can give to them and be of benefit to them. There's, again, another uh, example of of um, uh, saints helping each other. So some sometimes people help you spiritually and encourage you, but sometimes you help people by being a blessing to them materially, helping them with the resources that you have available to you. You will never go wrong helping out a person that you see struggling with a gift. And especially somebody who has blessed you spiritually, has been a model for you spiritually, have encouraged you spiritually, and you might see them struggling and yet you have resources or maybe you you don't have a whole lot of resources, but you take a little bit and you break off a little piece of your pie and give them some to help be a blessing to them. That's that's what the body of Christ should be doing with each other. They're modeling this for us here in uh, the book of Rome. It is being modeled for us there. And I thank the Lord for that. Verse 28 says, therefore. When I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Paul is saying that I once I have deposited and shared these gifts that the Macedonia saints are given to the saints in Jerusalem. I plan to visit Rome or to see you all in Rome on my way to Spain, on my way to where I'm going. I'm going to stop by Rome's Romans and see you and make a deposit. So Paul uh, is saying that he has going to share the gifts that he has gotten from the Macedonian saints and take them to Jerusalem. Verse 29, but I know that when I come to you, verse 29, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Paul is saying when he comes, he's coming with the full blessing of Jesus. Jesus has blessed me and given him saying he's he's blessed me and it authorized me and he'll be with me. I'm coming with the full blessings of Jesus Christ walking with me when I come and be with you. Praise God. So that's powerful. That's amazing. Now. These last few verses, verses 30 through 33. Let's let me read these verses and break them down to you. Verse 30. Now, I beg you, verse 30, brethren. Through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the spirit that you strive together with me in prayer to God for me. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is begging them to pray with him for several things. Let me go back. Let me let me read this. Verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Verse 32, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be be refreshed together with you. Now, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. All right. Let me let me let me break that down for you, because this this is going to break down. In Paul's prayer, here's what he's praying. He prays for them. First of all, he says, I'm praying that I'll be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, Judea, those who don't believe that they don't crucify me, that they don't reject me, that they don't try to kill me. He says, I want to be pray that I will be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, but also pray that uh, in that the what I do in Jerusalem, it will be acceptable to the saints that when I go there and minister and bring the gifts that I'm bringing, that it will be acceptable to the saints in Jerusalem, that they will receive what I'm bringing, that they'll receive the gift I'm bringing. But they'll also receive my ministry, that it will be acceptable to them. And finally, he beg he says, I want them. I, I'm begging. I'm asking you to pray that that when I come, I'll come with joy by the will of God that I'll have God, the joy of the Lord with me and that uh, they will all be refreshed, that they, that they all will be refreshed when he visits. 
that there will be a level of refreshing and strength given when he comes. Now, that's chapter 15. That is all of chapter 15. I love this prayer that Paul closes with. He says, pray I'll be delivered. Pray that I'll be a blessing. Pray that uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll have the joy because I'm in the scent of God's will. By the way, there is, there is joy in the scent of God's will in our lives. When you, when you walk in the scent of being in God's will, there is joy in that place. There is victory in that place. There is hope in that place. God wants you and I to be in a place of hope and victory because we're right in the center. It's ram smack in the middle of God's will. That's where joy is. And then he says, when I come, that, I, that my, my very presence will be, bring refreshing to you. That everybody will be refreshed to see me that would have so much joy. Thank Paul. Thank God for Paul and his ministry and this epistle. We've got one more chapter to do. Uh, chapter 16 will be our last chapter next, next week. And we'll, do, we'll be finished with the book of Romans. Thank God for these 16 weeks that we've done in what Paul has shared with us. Now, I'm... I'm, I'm I want to remind you today that if you're watching this and you haven't been saved, you know, we can help you get into a place of a walking with God. We can help you be in the center of God's will. Or maybe something in this lesson today spoke to you. Maybe about giving. Maybe about praying. Maybe about encouraging each other. Being beneficial to each other. Maybe like the early part of chapter 15 that God's called you and I to be in a place of encouraging one another. To being in the body of Christ. I believe that some of you are that don't go to church. You're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not connected with the body. You're not, you're not in, engaged in fellowship and relationship with each other. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be in fellowship and relationship with each other. If you don't have a church, we'd love for you to be a part of our church. we love for you. Because even though we have a lot of virtual members, we still have fellowship. Thank God for Zoom. Somebody say, thank God for Zoom. We do ministry through Zoom. If you live in another city another country even. You can be a part of the family of God. You can connect with us. And thank God that technology allows us to do now uh, what we were not able to do 15 years ago or 10 years ago. We can do that now. Build relationships. There's going to be a phone number that's going to come up on the screen. There's an email address. There's a phone number to call or a button to click that somebody's ready and prepared to minister with you, talk with you answer your questions. Is somebody able to get you in the right place with God? Let me ask you to make that phone call if you're unsaved, backslidden, unsure, or you don't have a church home. We'd love for you to be a part of our church family. We can help you get in right standing with God. We can help you get build relationship with him. We can help you walk in God's perfect will. We're able to do that. And I would encourage you right now to call that number. Be in the, right, be in the center of God's will today. Be right in smack in the will of God. That's when you get joy. Some of you don't have no joy because you ain't in the center of God's will. You're outside of his will. You're, you're, you may be living in carnality. You might be separated and in, 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 not in relationship with God like you should. We can help you get connected to the God of the universe. And there's nothing more joyful than be, having a relationship with the God of who made the heavens and the earth. Nothing can compare. Father, I pray for somebody watching this broadcast now. I'm praying for somebody today who needs a relationship with you. I'm praying for somebody right now, Lord, who is right now longing to be at peace, needing peace, needing joy. They're lacking it. And I pray in Jesus' name that you give them the courage to pick up the phone or give them the courage to be obedient and send that email so that we can connect them to a relationship with you is my prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for hearing our prayer and thank you for your loving kindness to us and your tender mercies, we pray. In the marvelous and matchless name of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <laughs>